The epiphany came while hiking El Camino de Santiago, also known as the Way of St. James. Being an ancient trail traveled by pilgrims in medieval times, it is made of a vast network of roads and paths, 700 kilometers or 500 miles long, and typically takes a seasoned hiker 35 days to complete. Before he became the best-known Latin American writer in the world, Paulo Coelho had a dream. A dream to become a writer. A realization that would reaffirm itself in a spiritual way while on the trail. Following his hike through the trail, he began to write again after a lengthy pause from the craft. His second novel, The Pilgrimage, based on his experience on the way to Santiago de Compostela, did not become successful in the way of sales or reviews, but he had succeeded with getting back to writing. Thus, the dream was far from over. He would soon embark on another book, a very personal, spiritual, and metaphorical one. It would not be an easy road to achieve success with the book, as none of the paths he had taken prior to this had been, but he believed in it wholeheartedly and refused to give up. You're listening to House of Words, a podcast about writers, authors, and spiritual paths. I am your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and today we're diving into the mystical world of Paulo Coelho's novel, The Alchemist. The first edition of The Alchemist was published in 1988 in Brazil and first published in the U.S. in 1993. The following synopsis is from a later edition. This is the story of Santiago, an Andalusian shepherd boy who dreams of traveling the world in search of a treasure as extravagant as any ever found. From his home in Spain, he journeys to the exotic markets of Tangiers and then into the Egyptian desert, where a fateful encounter with the alchemist awaits him. The Alchemist is a transforming novel about the essential wisdom of listening to our hearts, learning to read the omens strewn along life's path, and above all, following our dreams. Quote, you drown not by falling into a river, but by staying submerged in it. End quote. Paulo Coelho de Souza was born on August 24, 1947, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to a middle class household. His father was an engineer and his mother a housewife. Both were deeply religious and conservative, and as a consequence, young Paolo was sent to a Jesuit school at age seven. Later, he would be enrolled in Santo Ignacio College, where religious study was obligatory, something that did not sit all that well with young Paolo. He didn't like having belief imposed on him, and therefore grew to hate everything Catholicism represented. It was while attending Santo Ignacio that the first seeds of desire towards authorship surfaced. He enjoyed the craft, and after winning a poetry competition at the school, found that he was quite good at it as well. He decided then and there what he was going to do with his life. He was going to be a writer. Unfortunately, his parents did not share his joy for the newly discovered passion. Coelho's talent led him to join the Brazilian Academy of Letters, which is considered the most important literary institution in Brazil. It was there he dedicated himself fully to writing. He would write furiously, but would also realize that with immersing oneself in the craft of writing came frustration when the words didn't come out as one had envisioned or intended. His talent, however, was irrefutable. Once, when his younger sister found a piece he had written in the garbage, she took it because she knew that she sometimes had to write essays in school, something she wasn't as fond of as her older brother. The next time she was assigned to do an essay, she copied his paper and, as a consequence, won the first prize in the school and got the essay published in the school paper. She also received a copy of the famous children's book, The Little Prince, 
as a prize. Paolo's passion for writing kept reaching new heights, but with these new heights, his parents' resentment grew. His mother would on several occasions try to discourage her son from writing. This, according to Paolo, traumatized him. He was at an age when what your mother said was very important and carried much weight, and therefore created a conflict within him. This would lead him to lash out during his teenage years. When he was in his mid-teens, at a critical moment in his life, he read The Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller. The book relates the story of a man who decides to live outside the restrictions of what are considered social and moral conventions. In the book, he found the courage and articulation he needed to rebel against his parents, which led to conflicts. His rebellion would include drinking alcohol, going to parties, smoking, letting his hair grow long, and wearing clothes that were considered outside the norm. His parents fought back by enforcing curfews, curfews he would ignore. His grades would begin to falter, and he was soon failing in school. His father, not understanding his son, concluded that he recognized signs of madness in Paolo and had a doctor examine him. The doctor confirmed his father's fears, and in 1965, at age 16, Paolo Coelho was committed to a clinic for the mentally disturbed. He would later explain that he would mainly do two things in the clinic, either sit by the window and peer at the great view of Rio de Janeiro, or sit with a typewriter and write. Either way, he was isolated, something the doctors considered to be a part of his mental issues. He and his psychiatrist would sometimes discuss his writings and their meanings, but other more drastic measures were also taken, such as several sessions of electroshock therapy and heavy doses of medication. During his first stay, he would remain in the clinic for 20 days. The stay had not done much to alleviate the conflict between he and his parents. In fact, it only served to make matters worse, as once he was out, he was soon back to drinking heavily and behaving erratically. His parents, desperate to impose their rules and discipline, locked the front door on one occasion when Paolo failed to arrive before curfew. He did have the option of sleeping in the garden, but his anger and frustration topped off with the alcohol led him to smash things in the garden until his parents let him inside. When they finally did, he found his way to his bed and slept. When he awoke, there were two nurses in his room. They told him that because of his aggressive behavior, they were taking him back to the clinic. He complied without incident. The second committal would last for 60 days before he escaped. He made no contact with his family for two months following the escape, but ultimately, without money or resources, he was forced to yield and phoned his parents. They told him that if he returned, he would never be committed again. Following his return home, Paolo began working as an actor and journalist. His parents once more showed their strong disapproval over their son's choices. They considered the theater even worse than writing because in their eyes, it was a den of homosexuals which was not accepted in their religion. Those who were not homosexuals were good-for-nothings, bums, and dangerous people. Because of his refusal to accept his parents' restrictions, one year after his last committal, he was committed for a third time. He was to be in the clinic for 30 days this time, but again managed to escape and returned home. The conflicts between he and his parents were far from resolved, prompting his parents to once again contact a doctor, albeit a different doctor this time. This doctor told him that he would not send him back to the clinic as he recognized that Paulo was not insane. He instead had to find a way to make sense of his life. Coelho's later novel, Veronica Decides to Die, has several elements from his time in the clinic. In what appears to have been a last attempt to please his parents, he enrolled in law school. 
It would not last long, however, as he soon dropped out of the university and dedicated himself to an amateur theater group where he served as writer, actor, and director. As the 60s grew to a close, the world was overtaken by the hippie movement, one that Coelho quickly found a calling towards. With Brazil under a military dictator regime, he veered towards people whom he could ally himself with and continued to fuel his rebellious nature. Just as he had found Henry Miller's novel at the pristine time, so did he find the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band album. From then on, he joined the hippie movement with vigor, finding a new love for music as well. Traveling through South America, North Africa, Mexico, and Europe, he indulged in sex, drugs, rock and roll, magic, and the spiritual search. He also became interested in astrology and esoteric rites. It is around this time that he decided to write about the counterculture and founded the alternative magazine 2001. The magazine succeeded in uniting the hippies in Rio, However, only two issues were produced. Fortunately for Paolo, one of those issues crossed the eyes of Raul Satius, a music producer and musician who liked the writings and offered him a partnership as a writer for him. He helped Satius write seven of the twelve songs of his 1974 album, Gita, which became a great success in Brazil. Suddenly, never having had much money to his name, Paulo was earning more than enough to make a comfortable living. Together, Raul Seixas and Paulo Coelho wrote 60 songs and changed the face of Brazilian popular rock music at the time. Shortly thereafter, he and Seixas formed a group called Alternative Society. Their music grew more and more popular. They even began publishing the magazine Irreverent. The magazine encouraged the expansion of consciousness through the use of the imagination. The dictatorial regime of Brazil at the time, however, stapled the magazine as a political threat and banned its circulation. This then led to the arrest of Coelho and Seixas. Seixas, who was more famous than Coelho, was released just after two hours in custody. But as the writer behind what the military considered to be the real threat, Coelho was thrown in prison. Then two days later, immediately following his release, he was kidnapped by a group affiliated with the dictatorship. They tortured him for days before they, deeming him broken enough, let him go. Feeling exhausted by his life as a hippie and wanting a more normal, stable life after the incident with the military dictatorship, he managed to land a job at Polygram Records. There he met Cecilia McDowell. Three months later, they were married. With a steady income from his songwriting royalties, they moved to London, England in 1977, where they lived in a small apartment he bought a typewriter and decided to dedicate himself completely to writing again. He was experiencing an inner suffering that he hoped would be alleviated by writing, but it would not be such an easy fix. After a year in London, he had not managed to write anything. The suffering still present, he decided that England was not working out for him. So in 1978, he and Cecilia returned to Brazil where he found work as an executive at the record company CBS, a job that he would only hold for two months as it was obvious to him that he was unhappy and had to do something drastic. Deciding he wanted to start over again, he quit his job and divorced his wife. Moving on in search of improving his life, he met an old friend, artist Cristina Oichisica. They had connected in the past, but the timing was never right until that moment. By 1980, they were married. Their honeymoon was a trip to Europe. During a visit to the concentration camps, Paolo had a vision of a man that had told him they would meet each other later. Fast forward two months later in a cafe in Amsterdam, he saw someone that caught his eye. He realized that it was the same man from his vision and approached him. 
He told the man that he had seen him in the concentration camp, which led to a lengthy conversation. After this conversation, where the man told him that he would have to go on the way of St. James' pilgrimage, Coelho decided to return to the Catholic faith and the benevolent side of magic. To this day, he has not revealed who this man was. Soon after the encounter with the man from his vision, Coelho published his first novel, Hell Archives, in 1982 to little attention or recognition. Then, in 1986, having decided to embark on the 700-kilometer-long mystic walk, Camino de Santiago de Compostela, came a turning point. Along the 35-day-long journey, he had a spiritual awakening, which he would go on to describe in his second novel, the autobiographical, The Pilgrimage. He states that he learned some basic truths about life through the journey, one of which was the importance of setting concrete goals, in this case, it being Santiago de Compostela. The second was to travel light and not complicate things, because if you do, you will not reach a goal. The third basic truth was to pay attention to the other pilgrims and realize that there is something we learn through other human beings. The pilgrimage would be published the following year after his spiritual awakening in 1987. The book didn't attract much public or critical notice, but he had fulfilled his goal and he knew that he was not finished. He was set on dedicating himself to writing and not intending to waste time, he embarked on his next book soon thereafter. It would be a symbolic book, a metaphor for his life, and would be called The Alchemist. Allegedly, the novel only took two weeks to write. This would be a structure and a routine he would continue to utilize on his future novels, but more on that later. When asked how he managed to write it at such speed, he explained that the reason was because it was already written in his soul. He merely had to listen to his soul and let his fingers follow his inner voice. The book was a metaphor for his own life, although he is not sure why he chose a shepherd boy, as he has never been one. One could speculate that he chose the shepherd because of its religious connotations and his own recent religious awakening. The book delves into the idea that we are each responsible for our own destiny. For Coelho, his utmost wish was that each reader could discover what he or she believes to be the personal legend that exists inside each one of us, the objective of our lives. Once satisfied with the book, he found Rocco, an obscure publishing house that was interested in his writing. Being around 45,000 words long, the book was more like a novella, and having such a different tone than most literature at the time, it was somewhat of a risk for Rocco. Nevertheless, they pressed 900 copies and published it in 1988. Sales were not good. He would write in the foreword to the 25th edition of The Alchemist that a bookseller in northern Brazil back in 1988 told him that only one copy of the book was sold in the first week. It would then take six months for another copy to be bought, and it would be the same customer who bought the first one. He didn't even want to guess how long it would take for a third copy to sell. In the end, the book sold its 900 copies after a year but it was far from the success he or the publishing house had been hoping for. Rocco decided, therefore, not to reprint, in turn nullifying the contract and giving the rights back to Coelho to do with it as he pleased. He was 41 years old and desperate, but also undeterred. Believing in his book, he made it a goal to find another publisher and have it republished. He knew that he had something special, something that would be appreciated if only it reached the right people. After one year, in 1990, he managed to gain the attention of a publisher who wanted to publish his next novel, Berida. With the publication of Berida, The Alchemist was republished as well. And slowly, much through word of mouth, The Alchemist, though it had never had any marketing, 
began to sell. First a few thousand copies, then tens of thousands. It soon reached the top of the Brazilian bestseller list. By the end of 1990, it had sold a half a million copies, despite the fact that the press had not written anything about the novel. It appealed to many readers who had before not shown any interest in literature. This book presented to them the idea of seeking one's own goal in life and never giving up. This proved to be a winning formula, and by 1992, it had sold 1.2 million copies and was nowhere near slowing down. In 1993, the U.S. publisher HarperCollins decided to print The Alchemist, starting with a run of 50,000 copies. Though that number was significant at the time, it did not compare to the astounding success the book would eventually reach. Quote, Love is an untamed force. When we try to control it, it destroys us. When we try to imprison it, it enslaves us. When we try to understand it, it leaves us feeling lost and confused. End quote. Coelho has writing periods and non-writing periods. He likes the routine of releasing a book every two years and makes sure to stick to it. But considering he spends a total of two weeks writing a book in the span of those two years, it leaves a lot of time for other things he enjoys. He strongly believes that no writer should go around searching or looking for an idea because that hinders living in the moment. The writer, he believes, is then going to be detached from the emotions that one needs to live fully. You'll end up like an observer as opposed to a human being experiencing life. His advice to writers is to avoid thinking about writing every day. But do something else. Forget notebooks and forget about taking notes altogether. It is his belief that what is important in life will stick with you and you will remember these elements when you choose to sit down to write. If something is forgotten along the way, it was never important enough to you. He follows his own advice and is careful to allow life to unfold between books rather than look and search for inspiration. That being said, if he finds himself struggling to find inspiration in the middle of the book, he relies on his discipline to keep him going. He refuses to leave the desk until he has written something. It might take ten minutes or ten hours, but he sits there until he is able to keep writing. After a two-year wait without writing, he has, in his mind, fueled himself up considerably with different ideas and inspirations to tap into, which makes the process easier to accomplish. When in the midst of his two-week writing mode, he writes every single day without fail. His routine is also considered out of the ordinary as he starts in the morning with something most writers are told to avoid. Procrastination. He checks his email, he looks through the news, and pretty much finds anything else to preoccupy himself other than writing. Often, he'll go for a walk, which in particular, he finds it helps him think and find the places in his mind where he needs to go. Once home again, he sits down by his desk and continues to procrastinate by talking to his agent in Spain or his office in Brazil. This procrastination, believe it or not, serves a purpose. He claims that after procrastinating for hours, he feels the need to prove to himself that he can write. So he makes a point of writing for 30 or 45 minutes. This invariably turns into several hours, often more than 10 hours. By writing furiously when he does begin to write is how he is able to be as productive as he is. At the end of each writing day, he takes a multitude of notes for how the story will continue the next day. That note-taking, however, is mostly to get the thoughts out of his head so he can sleep, never actually using any of the notes the following day. For fourteen days, he goes through this process each and every day. He suspects that it's just a part of his inner ritual, one he has no choice but to follow. Coelho states that when it comes to the type of book he will write next, 
it's not up to him. He incessantly desires to write hundreds of books, but naturally ends up only writing one. This he accomplishes by allowing the book that wants to be written the most to find its way to the forefront of his mind, as opposed to him making the decision on a more conscious level. His reason for writing a book every two years is that it's a process of purging, a cleansing, a process he needs with regularity. Since the alchemist, Paolo Coelho has established himself as one of the most famous writers in the world. Furthermore, since its U.S. publication, the book has sold over 190 million copies worldwide, won 115 international prizes, and has been translated into 80 different languages. The book has also carved out a space for itself in the Guinness Book of World Records for the most translated book in the world by a living writer. Coelho himself has also won several international awards. Although at times criticized for repeating his style over and over again and trying to pass a self-help book as a novel, Coelho continues to write and continues to have a fan base of millions of readers around the world. All in all, it's fair to say that he followed the path that he was intended to and found what he was looking for. Before I go, one final quote to Senor Coelho. A successful writing day is the day that I suffer in the morning and I have fun in the evening. End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemour Hardin. I, along with my fellow producers of this podcast, ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash house of words. Until next time, Cangenue Verando Esas Paginas. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason Nemore Harden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason Nemore Harden. <laughs>